Right, can we start with the salawat, please? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajil faraja. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Are you serious? Start again. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Right, so we've been looking at Surah Al Ala, right? Surah number 87, 19 ayat. A maki surah. I can't see this recognition in your eyes, okay? A maki surah, what else? Favorite surah of the Prophet. When the first eye is revealed, what, do you, what does he say? Ij'aluha fi sujudikum. Put it in your sajdas. So what I asked you was if you could memorize the first ayah, which was? Sabbihisma rabbikal a'ala. And we did sabbaha. You know that? Ism. Rab and A'la, you good. So today I asked you to memorize Alladhi Khalaka Fasawa. You all right with that? That's three words. Alladhi Khalaka Fasawa. Now, I will give you the extra thing of memorizing a little bit more. One more. Three more lines. I mean, three more words. Alladhi Qaddara Fahada. So let's go to those two and three. Can we start again? Sabbihisma Rabbikal. أعلى الذي خلق فسوى والذي قدر فهدى. Now these four concepts go together. So let's look at ayah two and ayah three, and you put those four concepts together, which is خلق فسوى قدر and فهدى. You got those four? خلق is to create. You all know that. We're going to go through a small husna as well. Fasawa, do, do any of you know Swahili? If you know Swahili, you know Sawa Sawa. It's to make proper, right? So here, Fasawa is possibly a little bit sim. It's Taswiya, possibly a bit similar. He makes complete, okay? Then you have Qaddara and Fahada. Qaddara is, if I can say, stages. Make something perfect through stages. And hidayah, you know, is guidance. So I'm going to go through this again. The second two ayats, second and third, go through four concepts. Creation, making complete, stages in between the creation and the completion, and then guidance at each stage. Let's take some examples so we know what we're talking about. So you're talking about a human being. When a baby is born... There is no book that tells the baby that you have to suck like this. There's no book that tells the baby that you have to poo like this. I'm sorry, I've got to use words so you understand what I'm saying. The mother might buy a whole lot of mother and baby books because she doesn't know what to do. But the child knows instinctively how to be able to suck its, for its risk, as for its, its food, right? That is the hidayah at that stage. As a child grows up, then there, nobody tells a child, you will crawl like this. My last two grandchildren are twins. One of them crawls on all fours and one of them bum shuffles. Nobody told one, this is how you crawl and this is how you bum shuffle. They didn't do that. Nobody tells a child, this is how you speak. They will babble and they will put words together. So Allah provides hidayah at each stage. Now, so you have the baby, then you have the toddler. Then the toddler becomes a child. And you all know the hadith of the prophet, 0 to 7, 7 to 14, and 14 to 21. So in that child, those childhood years, you are not supposed to limit their wanting to explore their environment. Yes, you can, you will discipline, but to a certain extent, right? Once they become mature, now we call maturity, um, you could call it bulugh, right? For a girl, it may be anything between 9 to 13 years. Say, Sistani says it is 9 years, right? Then you have boys, who anything between 12 and 15, whatever the years might be. Bulugh becomes maturity. But it doesn't mean that they are mature enough to take the hidayah of divine guidance. If I told a nine-year-old, um, can you sort out your finances? 
Can you make sure that you pay all your comms? It's quite difficult. It's not an easy process, but she's learning. The bulug is taking her to a certain point. When a human being is mature, as in not bulug, but mature, then he or she has a choice of following divine guidance or not. You and I have free will. Divine guidance is the Quran and the Masumin, right? One is the speaking Quran and one is the silent Quran. We have a choice. Nobody forces us. Nobody's going to tell you, you have to follow the Quran. Nobody will tell you you'll have to follow the Masumin. But if you do follow them, then you come to another stage of Hidayah where Allah guides you or Allah takes you to all the difficult times in your life and he pulls you through. Yesterday we talked about Musa, right? We said that in Ayah 26, 60, Ayah 61, Surah number 26, the people of Musa said, the Bani Israel says, um, inna la mudrikun. We're gone. I mean, Firon is behind and the Red Sea in front. What did he say? Kala kalla inna ma'aya rabbi sayahdin. Indeed, my Rabbi is with me. You can only say that if you're absolutely certain that you've been following divine guidance. That you know what you're doing is right. You can stand on your musalla, put your hand on your heart and say, I did my best. Khalas. Now I leave it up to him. If there's a little bit of a problem there, then you start, you don't trust him enough. Okay? So I'll start again. At every stage of life, you and I are guided. But there comes a stage of maturity where you and I have free will. Now, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna ask you to put your hands up, but what does your Quran look like? Has it got, is it highlighted? Do you know the ayat? What do you follow? What do you not follow? Do you just follow what other people tell you? Or do you actually know what you're doing? What about the masumin? I'm going to put you on the spot. If I told you, come up to the mic and talk to me for five minutes about the 10th imam. Okay, two minutes about the 10th imam. How many do you think would have the courage to come here and not just tell me this was his mom and this was his dad and this was his grandfather because that's quite easy and this is where he was born and this is, this is your father and this is Kushali because you've looked it up on your phone. That's not how you know someone. I can't see any hands up and I'm not presuming that you don't know. All I'm trying to say is that you may have gone to Majalis for the last how many years? what your age is plus nine months, agreed? Because your mom probably came to these majalises. So you had all this information, yet we do not know much about our Aima. Yet these are supposed to be the divine guidance we're supposed to follow. What do I learn from him? What was there about him that I can take back and say, you know what, this is the 10th mom, this is what I do. Okay, let's look at his mom, who was his mom? Okay, I'm not putting you on the spot just yet, okay? I will later on, but not right now. So. Let's start again. Sabbihisma rabbikal a'la. You good with that? Yes? You're declaring his perfection. Now, when you look at these two ayahs, you have no choice but to say subhanallah. Because alladhi khalaka fasawa. Walladhi qaddara fahada. Those four concepts. To be created. To be made complete. In between the creation and complete, you have you have stages and at each stage you and I are guided there is no stage that is left out if you look at even simple things in Islam it says before you enter your house read this when you come out read this when you go to the mosque go with your left leg when you go with your to the bathroom go with your left uh, with your left leg mosque go with your right leg why because a human being is inclined, if you were to trip and fall, you're inclined to fall towards your right. So in a mosque, you'd fall in. In the toilet, you'd fall out. Cover your hair while you're in the bathroom. Have you heard that before? My, my grandmother used to keep a shela, or pocheri she used to call it, outside the bathroom. And she would say, just cover your hair, because hair attracts gunk. Now, obviously, you can smell stuff in the bathroom, yes? So that smell that you have in the bathroom, what is it? Is it not particles of poo? And what attracts particles? Your hair. Does it not? You're all nodding at me. But she used to cover her hair. It is mustahab to cover your hair. Today they tell you, I know everybody's got en sweets. Good luck. 
But your, your toothbrushes, do you keep them open in your bathroom or do you keep them closed? Do you cover them or you don't? Because the bristles will attract the gunk from your toilet. When you flush your toilet, do you close the lid or you leave it open and flush it? These are simple things that Islam told you so many years ago and they cause illnesses. Can you imagine if somebody took some of the stuff that's in the toilet and smeared it over your hair? What would you say? Really? You would say, Eow. but you're doing it anyway. You're just doing it anyway. Now, I'm not suggesting that you wear hijab if you go to the bathroom. But surely, I don't know, put your hoodies out. Do what you have to do. At least when you close the toilet, flush it. Because flush it when you close the lid. It's, it's the simple things. So he guided you at every single stage. He took you through everything. He said, when you wear clothes, recite this. And he said, oh, why do I have to do all that? There was a reason for it. Be in wudu all day. Why did he tell you that? Because there is some spirituality that is concerned with the wudu. That is the hidayah he gives you. All right? So I'll start again. Have you got those four concepts in? Yes? So each stage of your child's life, each stage of your life and my life, we will look at the hidayah that is relevant to us at that particular stage. Quran says, when a human being reaches 40, he suddenly realizes the importance of his parents. Read the Quran, it will tell you. At 40, he realizes, oh my goodness. And there's a dua, by the way. Okay. So there's quite a few things that we need to look into later on. But right now, I'd like to go back to Asma al-Husna. I think the books are up there. But if you don't have them, um, we've put them in the A'la book. So the first Asma al-Husna we're going to look at today. I know we said we do Hayyul Qayyum. I will. But we're going to look at Khalik. Khalik, one who creates from nothing. You have it in your Asma al-Husna book. I think we've put it up there, right? Okay. Khalik creates from nothing. In fact, you're told when you're, when you're pregnant, when you're expecting a baby, then you read, Ya Khalikul Bariul Musawwar, right? Surah number 59, Ayah 25, Wallahul Khalikul Bariul Musawwar. So Khalik, one who creates from nothing, absolutely nothing. Bariya is the one who now organizes, and maybe, maybe, maybe I'll try and explain it in a different way. Say you went into a shop, um, one of the shops in South Hall where they sell material. We're so used to buying ready-made stuff. We don't know what material is like, right? So you see the materials in those, in those what do you call them? Those rolls, right? Those big rolls. So you have a big roll of material. Imagine that, mater that roll just came up. That's Khalik. Just appeared. Bari is the one who cuts the cloth. So you told him or you told her, whoever's selling the material, that you needed one and a half meters for the top and one and a half meters for the bottom. Right? That's Bari. Musawir is then the designer who designs it to perfection to suit you. Let's start again. Kali creates from nothing. Bari then creates a mold. So let's look at a human being. So you have the mold of a man, you have the hold of a mold of a woman, right? You got that? Musawir now actually designs beautifully. I need, I need you to remember it so well. Imagine the Khalik as an architect. Imagine the Bari as the builder who builds the, the house. And imagine the Musawir as the designer. How do I remember this? Well, in Gujarati, 12 is Bar. You know that, yes? Yes, no? If you don't, you know it now. So number 12 in your, you've got these, right? Oh, she says. You have these in an A4 that look like this. So bar, you know what bar is now. It is bar. Before that comes Khalik. And after that comes Musawir. When you run out of ideas of creativity, say, Ya Khalik al bari al Musawir. You know when you think, I, I don't know, some people are so creative. Have you seen them? You give them a cake and they come up with a beautiful thing. Or you give them even potato curry and they can put it on the table and it looks like... And then you think, oh my goodness, that's my pot. It doesn't look the same as hers. Because she's garnished it with, I don't know, coriander and lemon and, and made it so beautiful. Yet mine looks like it's just been plonked up there. Mine might taste better though. However, however, presentation is really important. So when you learn out of creativity, Khalikul Bari Musawir. Are you good? 
When you are expecting your child, and I hope you have loads more. I know I can see one, two, three, whatever. Have lots. It's really good to have lots and lots of children. I've had 12, I've lost seven, but I've got five now. And with my five, my goodness, I wish I had 20. Are you looking at me? Okay. So, when you are pregnant, um, or when you're expecting a child, or you want your child to be something, something great, write down what you want your child to be. We've got Leil Dolgadr coming, no? I remember when I was pregnant with my last child. Halikal Bar al Musara was quite important. So the kids, the other kids were older. So they made a whole list. Big eyes, and they mentioned a person they wanted the eyes like. Hair like so and so. Face like so and so. They forgot genetics. But they made an order, and every morning they would say, Ya Khalikul Bari ul Musawir. And you know what? She turned out exactly what they had ordered. Okay? So, Ya Khalikul Bari ul Musawir. Are you good with that? Okay. The next word you have here, Alladhi Khalaka Fasawa. Walladhi Qaddara Fahda. So, we're going to look at Qadir. Have you got Qadir there? You've got your books there. You should open it and have a look. So, Qadir is in there. Qadr is somebody who is able. Somebody who is able to do absolutely anything. Just absolutely anything. Qadir. We read this all, all the time. Kul huwa al-Qadir. He is Qadir. He is able to do absolutely anything. Don't let anybody tell you that he can't do something. He can make the impossible possible. Let's look at Zakaria. Just giving you an example. There's Zakaria. Zakaria is looking around him. He's probably in his 80s, right? Wife is, hasn't had any children. So people think she's never going to have children. He's looking around him and he thinks, who's going to take this over? I can't see anybody in my family to do this. So he says, he does a dua and he says, Ya Allah, I need somebody who will be able to take this over. I need some, I, I need somebody will take over. Somebody will say, I need a progeny. And everybody looks at him and thinks, really? And then he's the one who's looking after Mariam. So just imagine for a minute. He goes to Mariam because he's looking after her. He goes to her in the temple that she's in this little room that she's there. And he sees fruits out of season. And he says, where are these from? Surah to Mariam by the time, read it. Where are these from? She says, meaning they're from Allah. And he looks at her, and there and then, the Quran says, Hunalika da'a Zakaria. There and then, Zakaria does dua. Rabbi habli milla dunka dhurriyatan. He said, Grant me this dhurriya, grant me this progeny. So he is told, for three days, don't talk to people. By the, by the way, at that time, fasting was not only food and drink, you also couldn't speak to people. Okay? Don't talk to people. And then he is with his wife, and this angel comes and says, we're giving you good news of a son called Yahya. Now, Quran says that she, the word used was dhahaka. So the translator said she laughed, which is plausible. Because if you tell a 78-year-old you're going to have a baby, and you told me I was going to have a baby, yeah, I'd sit down and go pray two rakats, okay? So you're saying dhahaka, Quran say, you know, translations say they laugh, but dhahaka also means ovulated. So the, the thing to recognize is that she ovulated and she had a baby at that age. So that is al-qadir. Don't let anybody tell you something is impossible. If he could have a baby then, I mean, you can do anything, reach the skies. You cannot limit yourself. You know, right now you're busy with all your little ones. But when you get to my age and the children have all grown up, you sort of think, there must be something I can do. And don't limit yourself. Climb mountains. I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro last year. Climb mountains. Do what you want to do. But do something that will take you and use Ya Qadir. My mother used to tell me, and I'd like you to write it down. Ya Qadirul Muqtadirul Kawiyul Qaim. It will give you strength from places you don't even know. Muqtadir is number 70. Qadir is 69. Again, Ya Qadirul Muqtadirul Kawiyul Time. When you're feeling low, when you're feeling you can't do something, when you feel things are impossible, ya qadirul, muqtadirul, kawiyul, time. You know your children are still young. They will come to a stage where they will say no. 
and you will look at them. Oh, they haven't said no yet. Ah, okay, they will, they will. No. Or they will say, I don't understand this. You're of a different generation. Ya qadirul, muqtadirul, kawiyul, qaim. The strength to remain quiet and handle it calmly. Okay, so that's qadir. Alladhi qaddara fahada. The next one is hadi. And hadi is, is number 94. And I'm hoping you're also going to fill them into your sheets, right? So Hadi is 94. Hadi is the one who guides you to your full potential. We talked about it a couple of days ago. When you say, Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim, the name of Allah is Al Hadi, He who guides you. Right? There's nobody else who can guide me except Him. So when I need direction, I need direction from Him. Part of finding direction when you're completely stuck is something called Istikhara. Have you heard about Istikhara? Okay, so people try and do istikharas. Istikhara is literally seeking khair. Before you go and call the next Molana and do istikharas, by the way, it's no problem, go into sajda. Go into sajda and say, Ya Allah, I am seeking khair. I want to find the right way out. And you're supposed to seek khair in everything. It's only when you're completely 50 50 and you don't know where to go, that's when you go to somebody who knows how to do istikharas and go and do an istikhara. By the way, do you know somebody who does an istikhara has to do a ghusl? Can you imagine the amount of ghusls they have to do? Right? Especially with people who say best of three and best of five and best of seven and all the rest of it. So, al hadi. So, let me go back again. What was the three words for creator? Khalik, bari, and musawir. 11. 12 and 13. Are you good with that? Okay. Qadir, what number was that? 69. And the way I remember 69 is, imagine a womb with twins in them. One with head down and one with head up. It's only because twins are in my brains, okay? So only Al-Qadir can create that. Are you good with that? You won't forget, will you? Right, what was Hadi? What number was Hadi? 94. So you've got to fill them in. Are you good with that? Okay. So what we're going to do today, because we've done these two, I don't want to go into the fourth ayah, which we'll look at tomorrow, is for you to look at your memorization, memorization sheet. You had a big A4 sheet. Obviously, you haven't brought it. These are in the Asmal Husna book. I'd like you to, when you go home, draw lines after every nine. So if you drew a line after every nine, how many sections do you have? Sorry, nine divided by 99 is, come on. 11? So we're going to do 11 sections where we're going to learn them and hopefully by the end of Ramadan we will know all 99 in order. Are you good? And today we will do the first nine. Okay? All right. So I'd like you to close your eyes. And if you've got children, don't close your eyes because they'll run away. Okay? But otherwise, close your eyes and imagine a king. Are you good? Imagine this story. The Rahman and the Rahim king. Are you good with that? The Rahman and the Rahim king. He sent holy salams. Holy means Quddus, right? The holy as in not with a hole, but H-O-L-Y. The one with the ring around your head. The Rahman and the Rahim king sent holy salams. Are you good with those five? Rahman, Rahim. Quddus, Rahman, Rahim, Malik, Quddus and Salam. The way I remember salam is you do salam with five fingers, with your one hand, right? So five is salam. Let's start again. Rahman, Rahim, Malik, Quddus, and Salam. So the Rahman and Rahim king sent holy salams. Who did he send those salams to? To a mu'min. Are you good with that? He sent salams to this mu'min. Are you good with that? And what does this mu'min do? Why does this mu'min get salams? Because he guards himself or protects himself against being incomparable and forceful. Protects himself from being Aziz and Jabbar. Are you good with that? Let's start again. Rahman, Rahim. Malik, Quddus, Salam. Who does he send the Salam to? Mu'min. Why? Because that Mu'min protects himself. Muhaymin. And Muhaymin against two things. Aziz and Jabbar. Are you good? Let's start again. Rahman, Rahim. Malik, Quddus. Salam, 
Mu'min. Muhaymin, Aziz, and Jabbar. Let's go through the story again. The Rahman and the Rahim, king. He sent holy salams. You're good with that. And he sent those salams to the Mu'min. Because that Mu'min protected himself from being incomparable, which is Aziz and Jabbar. Are you comfortable with that? Okay, so what we're going to do now is look at those nine and try and understand them so we can fill them into, our, in, into whatever books you have. Okay? So I talked about Rahman and Rahim when I did the three hours. You remember. Are you good with Rahman and Rahim? Rahman is incredibly, oh, completely merciful. And he's merciful to all. There's no such thing as he's going to pick anyone out. Rahim is there's extra mercy to those who connect to him. I talked about the dentist and the hygienist. Right? Both of those words come from the Arabic word Raham, which means womb. Now, a womb is where a child is totally looked after. Every aspect of the child is looked after. So, Rahman and Rahim, the Rahma is that who will actually look after every aspect of yours, provided you let him, and I talked about that story as well. Are you good with Rahman and Rahim? So, I told you, what is Rahman? Incredibly, limitlessly kind. What is Rahim? Extra kind to believers. So I'm always going to have Ya Rahman and Rahim at the end of my everything. That is why everything I start with is Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I'm going to tell you stories because that's the only way I remember. It's the only way you might remember. There is a story we tell our children in preschool about this person who is told, I'm sorry, but your deeds have taken you to the fire. You need to be cleansed by the fire. We need to take you there. This is the day of judgment. And this is story told by the Masumin. So he gets to the door of Jahannam. But because his mama had taught him that whenever he entered somewhere, he would say, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. It was something that was ingrained in him. So whether it was his murabi, his mother or teacher, somebody had taught him that wherever you go, before you enter, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. So he's entering Jahannam and he's saying Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. And the angels are told, stop. We call that story stop. Stop. And Allah says, I cannot allow somebody to enter the fire who takes my name of mercy before he enters. Only one surah of the Quran starts with the name of God, number 55, which is Rahman. So you know what? Even if you forget everything I told you today, at least get into the habit of teaching your children and yourselves wherever you go, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. It's not just hearsay. It's something we have to do. When we are told from a hadith that when Imam Hussein's son, and I don't know which one, recited Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim for the first time, he gave everything he had to the teacher. And said, But I have done nothing. She, this child comes from your household. He said, No. Today, my child recited Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim after he went to Madrasa or whatever you call them over there. So it's really, really important. We, you and I call somebody who has died Marhum or Marhuma, don't we? Same word. One who has been encompassed in Allah's Rahmah. People get so upset when somebody calls you Marhum or Marhuma. I say, I haven't died yet, but for God's sakes, you're encompassed in his Rahma. So don't get upset if somebody by mistake calls you that, right? If you look at Dua'i uh, Komel, how does it start? Allahumma inni as'aluka bi rahmatika allati wasi'at kulla shay. I ask you by your Rahma that encompasses everyone. It's phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. The way I live Rahman and Rahim is that whoever looks at me thinks there is kindness. At least we are able to manifest it. Being kind is very difficult, very, very difficult. It's not easy at all. Okay, let's just go through a couple of differences between, or some differences between Rahman and Rahim. Rahman is intensive. Rahim is constant. So Rahman is immediate, okay? Rahim is not necessarily now. Rahman is general. Rahim is extra mercy. Rahman is temporary. Rahim is permanent. Rahman is present. Rahim is future. Are you good? 
It's all in the book, by the way. You can download, we'll try and we'll send you a link on the WhatsApp group, or you can buy the book, whatever you want to do. It's entirely up to you. The third one is Malik. You remember? Rahman, Rahim, and Malik. Now, Malik is the absolute owner. I talked about it a little bit yesterday. He has complete control. You and I don't have control. We might say we own this thing, but when it falls down, we can't do anything about it. I own my body, but when my head hurts, I can't say get better. It's never, never going to get better. While Allah is the complete owner. In other words, he has complete control, complete ownership. So he's Malik, right? If you want respect from people, recite it after Fajr. You've got all this in the, in the book anyway, so you can do this. If you look at Surah Al-Jumu'ah, you recite Surah Al-Jumu'ah? يُسَبِّهُ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ الْمَلِكُ الْقُدُّوسُ الْعَزِيزِ الْحَكِيمِ So what's the first one? Al-Malik. He is in control, nobody else. Problem with human beings is we try to control people. We try to control our children. Oh, you're smiling at me, right? You can't. You just can't. You may be for a little period of time but you can't control them. When you need help because you can't control them, Ya Malik, use those continually. He will be able to help you in it, okay? Right, next one, Kudus. Kudus, I said, was holy, but it's flawless. No mistakes at all. Absolutely no flaws, completely, okay? Um, the way I remember Kudus is seeing that little halo around your head. That's what people call holy, right? He's free from every imperfection, from absolutely every defect. That's what Qudus is. That's what he does. So when you look at yourself and you say, um, you know what? You say, I, I don't understand. I don't understand how this happens. I don't understand how this happened. I have a young child who comes to workshop. Um, he's now grown old. I think he's about 15 now. But when he was six, I remember he came up to me and he said, Oh, my auntie, I got something really urgent to tell you. I thought, okay, <laughs> it's difficult, right? So he said, I said, let's sit down. So we sat down and he said, my uncle has got so much anger. Now, that was the urgent thing, right? He says, my uncle is really an angry person. I said, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. Maybe you could recite Surah Al-Qadr. He said, no, but I've got his genes because I get very angry when my mama talks to me. Okay? So... When you have that sort of understanding of an imperfection, read Ya Quddus continually. You cannot blame it on your genes. You can control it. But it's dawa and dua. So you've got to read Ya Quddus from relief, from any sort of agitation that you might have. You can't blame it on everything else. I've put something in the reflections here, which is a dua, which says, distance me from my sins as you've distanced the east from the west. Right? And purify me as a white robe is purified of dirt. That reminds me of, um, of a scholar that I speak to very often. And I'm always telling him, I just don't understand these kids. My kids, by the way. And he says, it's your fault. And I go, well, what did I do wrong now? And he said, you brought them to this country. And I said, and? Wanted them to go to good schools, wanted them to go to good universities. Didn't want to stay in East Africa, by the way. So wanted the children to, to come to a place where they would prosper. And he said, imagine telling your child who is wearing white clothes to go down a black coal pit. You know what a coal pit is, right? And then to tell your child, come out of that pit without a stain on your white clothes. Is that possible? Yes, no, maybe, perhaps, no. Unless you homeschool your children, unless you are able to protect your children, which you can't, you need help. You need a lot of help. And the help you ask for is from Ya Quddus. You have to help him because we want to keep them flawless as much as possible. Okay? The next one is Salam. Salam is the source of peace. We say salamun alaikum, and when you say salamun alaikum, it's literally saying, may you be immersed in peace, and may you be surrounded by the security of Allah. Not salam alaikum, and the moment that back is turned, you start talking about them. Salam means that's it, khalas. You know, if you held somebody's hand, 
and you said salamu alaykum i mean he he takes off all your sins if you hugged that person he takes off all your burdens the prophet when he shook people's hands and he said assalamu alaikum he wouldn't let go of their hand until they pulled it away because the longer you hold their hand the longer your sins fall off now that doesn't mean just hold on to somebody's hand okay i have a bit of time that is why after every salah salatul jamaa you know you shake hands i keep on saying this every year i remember one salatul jamaa putting my hands out and she said what do you want i said your hands that's all i want nothing else okay So when somebody reaches out hold hands say salam hug them sins fall off your back I haven't got time and I'll stop at salam but literally silam in arabic is a ladder and silam provides the tool to go higher the more peace there exists in a house the more salam there exists the more the children will thrive the more the family will thrive so I'm going to go over these again Rahman Rahim Malik Quddus Salam Mu'min Muhaimin Aziz and Jabbar By the way if you have somebody who is ill recite ya salam all the time it, and you know prevention is better than cure read it on water well, today when you're giving iftar read it on water 10 times 100 times whatever you want and put that water in the middle you know when they drink it they will be peaceful inside and outside inshallah we will continue with this tomorrow Um, can we end with the surah al-fatiha bismillahir rahmanir rahim alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin arrahmanir rahim malik yawmiddin iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in ihdinas siratal mustaqim siratal ladhina an'amta alayhim ghayril maghdubi alayhim waladdallin sadaqallahu alazim li khamsatun utfi biha harral waba'il hatima al mustafa wal murtada wa abnahuma wal fatima for the children in the rahma room you will have to go collect them and please do not just leave your children outside please go and collect them and pick, i mean drop them and pick them up jazakumullah khair i would suggest you get the books because they do help okay oh they're 10 pounds each <laughs>